It's time to talk about hardware, technology, science, and gaming, and whatever else the hell we want to talk about. That was very uh, not grammatically correct. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is just talk about all the stuff we've got coming up. And, of course, we've got the new Intel X99 stuff that we've been playing with this week. Uh, but we also have the AMD stuff, and we've been playing with that as well, like the 9590 and the 80, um, or the 8370. Uh, been playing with those CPUs. And I'll give you guys just some really basic, you know, not scientific stuff. But the 9590 and the new Extreme $1,000 CPU from Intel, you know, uh, was it 1559-60X? Um, are really very similar as far as gaming performance goes. I mean, they're not that different at all. In fact, the 9590 was even faster in Lichdom, which is optimized for AMD, but most of the other games, the Intel won by a few FPS. A few FPS. But when it comes down to productivity, it was literally twice as fast, almost to the second. It was like twice as fast. So rendering, anything like that that's optimized for multiple you know, threads, just absolutely destroys and you get your thousand dollars worth but if you're building a gaming rig and you're buying one of these specifically for gaming you're crazy so that's you're gonna you're gonna see more in the upcoming videos and we've also got uh, a graphics card showdown coming up you know the the two itx gpus we're gonna put those guys head to head we've already done some of these benchmarks now i just need to hire a new editor to help edit all this stuff that we've got going on jimmy's gone so uh you guys can check him out on his own channel and we'll be looking for a new editor very, very soon. In fact, now we're looking for a new editor. So, yeah. Anyway, uh, what have you got going on? We've got so much hardware stuff, it is going to be crazy. Uh, we've got this uh, upcoming video on a Dell. Uh, it's PowerEdge R720. That's a 2U rack server. It has 128 gigs of RAM and uh, just under 10 terabytes of disk space. It's got the very top-end RAID controller in it, although we didn't get any of the PCIe SSDs because we thought those were way, way, way too expensive. The cost-benefit ratio just didn't make sense there. So we're going to be reviewing that. And on that, we're going to be looking at uh, Zen, uh, or no, I'm sorry, KVM. We're going to be looking at Linux and KVM first, uh, Zen later. Um, and uh you know setting up virtual machines and things like that and for the home users we're also going to be using or you know small business users too we're also going to be using the amd 8350 because an 8350 running kvm runs like grease lightning and oh my goodness you're not going to believe how awesome it is so we're going to show you how to set up um kvm on debian with a nice web gui and it works really well and you'll be able to just one click a few buttons and create an open vz container or create a full vm so it'll be pretty neat i think you guys will like it oh we've also got monitor tests so i don't know if you can see Ooh. it in the video but there's an ancient crt monitor like way over there yeah and we got the corner of it a, in, the shot, in the shot yeah that, that's a silicon graphics crt silicon graphics so which is you know the cadillac <laughs> of monitors and uh, we've put it up against the Crossover 290M. That's the extra wide monitor, which hopefully the review's out by now. And the 270 uh, first, uh, and the X-Star, which is a Samsung panel. And so the, the Samsung panel, we were able to overclock to 120 hertz. And we used some really high speed shutter photography to take pictures of the CRT and the LCD side by side. I'll give you a preview though. The Samsung TN panel is slower and it's, it, it lags behind than the uh, Samsung IPS panel. The Samsung IPS panel is about eight milliseconds, eight to 10 milliseconds behind the CRT. The uh, Samsung 4K, the U28D590, is like 40 milliseconds behind the CRT, 40 to 50 milliseconds. It's crazy. You know, um, I'm pretty much completely over TN panels. And I, I jumped on Twitter and Jay's two cents if, you, if you're out there watching, what's up, man? He was looking at some TN panels for gaming. He wanted to get three of them, uh, probably 1080p, because he's going to be running, you know, the uh, surround. I believe he's, I believe he's got three 780 uh, ties in uh, with with the water cooling and everything. But uh, you know, I'm, I'm always in there recommending the the uh, IPS panels. But we went back and forth for a little while, and it just seems like the consensus out there for gaming is that IPS panels are just no good. And a lot of people do want the you know the 120 hertz or 144 hertz, which T IPS doesn't really have stuff that's that crazy but you can overclock these things you know like the one the xdr right behind me over there that that pretty monitor can be overclocked to about 120 hertz you do drop a few frames here and there uh so i tend to keep it at 60 hertz but i don't know it's it's for me 
I am totally happy gaming on this. My colors are way better. Uh, the viewing angles are way better. And I'm just a happier person overall. <laughs> so anyway. I couldn't... Uh, with the high-speed shutter photography on the Samsung, now the, keep in mind that 4K Samsung monitor is advertised as a one millisecond response time. And the high-speed high shutter photography that we have of that monitor clearly shows that it's not really that, it's not really one millisecond. Because with a, with a CRT, uh, when, the, when the electron gun has moved off uh, from painting, you can see the picture, the image fade. And you can totally see that in the still photography with the samsung you can kind of see like one frame on top of another frame and it's sort of fading out but it still takes a while to fade out and it is a little worse on the ips panels like it does take a like from when you change from you know frame one to frame two and you've got the frame blending while frame one is fading out and and frame two has come on really quick because it takes a little while for it to fade out when you look at it in the high speed photography you can see that the tn panel is a little faster but the difference between one millisecond and 16 milliseconds, 16 milliseconds is the amount of time between frames at 60 hertz. Uh, it, no, it's not the difference between one millisecond and 16 milliseconds. It's, it's maybe, maybe four milliseconds, maybe, between four and eight, I would guesstimate. And this isn't an exact science the way that we're doing it, but the IPS panels that we, we, we tested were never more than one frame per second behind the monitor. And on average, uh, we were catching the LCD with half of the old frame on it and the new frame on top of it. And so if it weren't for the fade out time, the time between the Korean Samsung IPS panel and the uh, CRT would have been would, would have been nothing. But the reality is it's about a half a frame. And you guys will see all of that stuff pretty soon. I mean, over the next couple of weeks. All right, I was so, blown away. I took to Twitter to be like, what am I doing wrong? And it's like, the TN panel should be one millisecond. It's not. Lies. I feel betrayed. Buy our t-shirts. Buy everything. Do it. We've got snifters. Yeah. Snifter. Almost nearly killed her. Never mind. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> let's talk about 10 terabyte hard drives that are helium filled. So these hard drives, uh, they're helium filled, meaning that when they spin... They make a very high-pitched spinning sound, right? That's how it works with helium. I think that's no pretty one much cares. It. No, yeah. that's not <laughs> it. No, <laughs> that's Jesus Christ. That's the, that's the only reason they did it, that just so they could have a nice, really high-pitched like, sound. It sounds like a Kawasaki motorcycle versus a Harley Davidson, which are the standard, you know, air feel, air just standard, you know, normal air. Never mind. So the, these things are completely airtight, and there's helium inside, allowing things to move around a lot quicker. Uh, and I mean. Just tons of platters. How many platters are in this thing? Like eight platters or something? It's crazy. More platters than I feel comfortable with. Yeah, there's an absurd amount of platters in here. And um, they're not even using the uh, SMR technology. That's the sh shielded ma magnetic recording, which allows you to cram more data onto the same space. They've decided that that um, is not fast enough. So they're using just standard technology, helium completely filled uh, and sealed completely. Uh, and, uh, you know, just tons of platters. That's it. That's crazy. Well, well now, the, the, the HGST uses the shingled magnetic recording, SMR, oh, it to does use the it. Arrow. Yes. Hmm. But I thought that was a little slower. I thought, okay, I'm saying this backwards. Okay, yeah, that, that is a little slower. Hmm. Yeah, that's the 10 terabyte. The 8 terabyte uses perpendicular magnetic that's... recording, which is, which is contemporary. Yeah. But it is the a performance faster. of SMR is not yet up to that of PMR, so the PMR drive should be faster. Right, so the 8 terabyte will be faster. Okay, I got that backwards, right? Yeah, still pretty wild. And um, SanDisk has a 512 gigabyte uh, SDXC card. And the theoretical capacity is 2 terabytes, so, I mean, we're getting up there. 512 gigabytes is, um, is pretty Half ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's getting up there, and a lot of professionals, you know, they've gone out and they've uh, purchased you know, P2 cards, and they purchased um, solutions for recording on the go that actually have an SD card slot. I mean, there's some really professional cameras out there where you just plug SD cards and you rip the SD, not, not SD cards, um, what am I saying here? Um, uh, SSDs. You plug an SSD into some of these things, um, and then, then when you're done, you rip it out and you put it in a dock and you export all your beautiful raw video footage. But something like this um, is not fast enough for, you know, like, the heavy-duty raw stuff it's 95 megabytes per second on the uh, when you plug it up to 
like a USB 3 drive or something like that. But when you're in the camera, it's going to should be around 90, 90 megabytes per second. I mean, it's fast enough for, for most things. But, uh, yeah, you'll still end up having to go to the uh, SSDs for the, the raw capturing. But you'll get tons of uh, pretty footage on that on that 512 gigabyte uh, card, like tons and tons of it, footage. It doesn't matter that the 512 gig card is out, but hopefully what this will translate to is that the more affordable 64 and 128 bit, or 128 bit, 128 gigabyte cards will be um, practically given away. You'll be able to get them at every corner drugstore for $5 each. At least that's what I want, because I need some. <laughs> Let's talk about some motherboards. Now, that, that motherboard you were talking about with the Dell, was that based on Intel's uh, C612 chipset? Uh, like this, yes. this Asus here? It, yeah. it is based on the C600, which is Socket 2011-2. So this is not a server, this is not a Socket 2011-3 server, but it is still a $14,000 server. So it should be yeah. a pretty interesting benchmark. Yeah, I just want to show this one off here. It's a pretty Asus, you know. It's, it's nice. Lots of lots of cores. If you need lots and lots of cores, lots and lots of threads at the same time, then you're going to have to go with one of those. All right, let's talk we about... We will be doing... We Good. will be doing an updated workstation build based on this motherboard because our other workstation build that we did had got 100,000 views. So apparently people like that. So we'll, we'll be doing it again, but with 2011-3. And those of you that just got your trash can Mac, oh, you got an obsolete processor socket. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I'm not even sorry. You guys paid that much money for it. I'm not even sorry. I'm, I'm an ass. I'm sorry. Uh, so, Wendell, what do you get? When you mix buckyballs with diamondoids. Uh-oh. <laughs> you get some strawberry jam? jam. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be some weird tasting strawberry jam. Doubled bucky diamondoids. Yeah, that's what you get. Bucky diamondoids. So um, they're, they're basically um, high-powered. Let me just read it here from the side. High-powered electron devices. Uh, and they could be used to make ultra-thin things like smartphones or technology that could be uh, just hidden in plain sight. That could be interesting. So what they've done is they've created, they, by combining these two things, they've created uh, something that allows electrons to move in one direction. So it's pretty much the smallest circuit ever, I guess. That well, could be interesting. things that let current move in only one direction is not really a new thing. We've had diodes for many years, but this is... This would be uh, kind of replacing the role of diodes, I mean. It, it's is so orders small. Of mag it is orders of magnitude tinier. Yeah. It doesn't really say much about like what the circuit characteristics are, but uh, this this will be useful in fabricating nanoscale circuitry because pretty much the the more that they can move, you know, onto onto the microchip, the more that they can fit on the microchip, the more fun, interesting things they can do on the microchip. So maybe maybe they can do a pass where they coat these things on the die, and then they don't have to bother soldering the very tiny versions of these to the bottom. I'm I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, we're talking about. I mean, your diodes are. We're talking about stuff that's, I mean, the size of a large molecule compared to a diode. So, I mean, can you imagine a that's little... That's pretty tiny. <laughs> can you imagine like a little camera or a little microphone that you could just, you could throw it on a wall and it's so small that it would blend right into the paint of the wall. You wouldn't even notice that it was there and, and you'd almost have to have a special device to come and find it, you know? You, you wouldn't be able to just... It, 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 that's how small the things could be. Hmm. There's... I'm also, the, the article doesn't mention anything about other potential applications because uh, very old memory, I, I want to say core memory, but it's not core memory because core memory was magnetic storage, but there was a very old memory uh, technology that relied on diodes to store uh, bits. And so this could bring back that kind of technology because one of the reasons that transistors has taken off is, hey, we can shine a laser at at a silicon wafer and get these electrical properties out of it. If, if we can do something similar with this, then it may open up a whole new uh, type of semi, you know, the small scale semiconductor um, uh, manufacturing, well, not, not really semiconductor, but a small scale memory storage uh, um, components like we have now with uh, capacitors and transistors and things like that at a nanoscale. So it'll be interesting to see how this is applied in the industry. All right, so let's, 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 keep, let's keep with the whole small thing and talk about um, this really interesting discovery. So uh, I believe we got some Stephen Lee. Yeah, Steve, Steve Lee from ANU University, he accidentally created this. He, he was just playing around with, uh, I guess, some silicon gel or like a silicon polymer, and he made a little droplet and then uh, basically turned the droplet upside down, and it made like a nice almost little lens. Put that onto a, um, a cell phone, 
and all of a sudden you've got a little microscope. It's and it costs about a penny to make, or he said even less than a penny to make this lens. And it's, it seems just so ridiculously simple, but I mean, you can get down to seeing almost, he said that you could see almost individual cells with this lens if you put it on the back of a cell phone. So the application for this would be, let's say you're out in a field and um, you need to get some samples back to the lab immediately. Well, you could just whip out your cell phone with this lens on it, take some samples, and then digitally send those things back to the web for uh, or back to the uh, the lab for analysis. Uh, it would also be great for uh, emerging markets um, that do not have tons of resources, lots of money, or anything like that. They can easily afford these. Whereas, like a lot of the lenses that are used for microscopes are extremely uh, you know expensive, prohibitively expensive. So this is a very interesting accidental breakthrough, and, and yet another point in in history where we see someone. Uh, inventing something very cool with a moment that's not a eureka moment, but a moment where it's, huh, that's funny. And I always, <laughs> I always love those kind of moments. They're fun. So This does look like a fun invention. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to buy it, and then I'm going to take pictures of weird things and sell it as artwork in, in galleries, because that's what you do. Uh, should we talk about graphene? Uh, maybe a little quick mention. More, more uses for graphene. Of course, graphene is one atom thick. It's a carbon-based thing <laughs> but anyway they're they're using a um a layer of graphene uh to basically seal things and with this layer of graphene and you've got to modify it because graphene will i believe allow water to pass through but it can be it, it, it allows water to pass through but it, it catches a lot of other things so it can be used for filters and that sort of thing but by modifying it a little bit it'll actually it can actually be used to seal things and this could be used to put a coat on top of paint um, and, and basically whatever you coat with it almost gets the properties of graphene, which is like the strongest thing that known to man right now. So you could coat, a, you know, a boat with this and then the paint's not going to be, you know, you're not going to have to worry about rust. Let's say the, the bridge, what's the uh, um, Golden Gate Bridge out there? Every day of the year there is someone painting the Golden Gate Bridge. It never stops because of, you know, corrosion and rust. One coating of this may be pretty expensive, but hey, that's it. You coat it in this and it should be good to go. No more painting. It should be able to seal it from the elements and keep it from oxidizing and all that sort of thing. Pretty interesting. So yet another use for graphene. All right, moving along uh, to an article that I forgot to read. <laughs> Did you read the article about uh, the flexible devices that could be on the way? Yeah, well, basically this is just saying that, you know, the, uh, the, the face of the Apple Watch holds more clues to a more flexible future, which is totally a clickbait headline. Uh, but a a Apple hasn't disclosed why the Apple Watch has a flexible display. It might allow for a slight curve at the edges. Well, I think they kind of talked about that in the press release. It was, uh, you, you can use that instead of putting your fingers onto the screen and obscuring what you're doing, you can use the, the edge of the watch. But I'm not really sure if it's the LCD component or just the Gorilla Glass coating on top. But Samsung has been working on flexible displays forever, and if you guys haven't heard about any of the possibilities with flexible displays, then you should look at that. But, you know, imagine a 24-inch monitor, you know, on its short edge, it's maybe t 10 inches, 11 inches, something like that. So you could have a, a tube that's, you know, an inch or two around and 11 inches, and you could just carry that with you wherever. And it's like, oh, I need a 24-inch 1080p monitor. You can just grab that, pull it out, and just stretch out from the tube, and then you've got a 24-inch monitor that you got out of the tube. So, you know, that's the promise of, of portable displays. And a phone that, you know, you could basically pull it out, a roll-up display from the watch. That's flexible displays. That's That's where that technology could be. And this is an article talking sort of about the different things that are available and where things were in 2013 and blah, blah, blah. But it, it's it, it's totally clickbait because it's like, oh, Apple iWatch, it's got a curved display. Let's randomly talk about those things. The only reason I want their, uh, their devices to be flexible is so I can wad them up. <laughs> the only thing that I would do with that. All right, let's go ahead and talk about something that makes me kind of happy. Um, the aurochs has long been extinct. And uh, I guess, what, about 70, 80, maybe 80, 90 years ago, the Heck brothers over in Germany decided they wanted to bring the aurochs back. And uh, I'll, I'll try to be quick on this because it's something that fascinates me. Maybe it doesn't fascinate you guys out there as much. Um, but uh, it's the aurochs was, I guess, bred into the cow that we have now that's you know good for meat, um, carries around a lot of milk and that sort of thing. 
just full of lactose, you know. Uh, but the aurochs was a much mightier beast that was made to roam the hills and also trim the hedges. So it's a, uh, it was out there running around, uh, keeping keeping the environment in check. And uh, they they're pretty much gone. I mean, there's there's no aurochs now. They're way bigger than a standard cow. And so the the Heck brothers back you know whatever 80 years ago. I guess uh, close to the Nazi time, um, they were trying to breed them back into existence, sort of like, you know, breeding in the opposite direction. Uh, but that that had never actually happened. But now there's a new group of scientists, and uh, what they're going to do is they're going to use modern techniques to try to bring back the aurochs. And the purpose is not, you know, we're not going to have like an aurochs burger. Hey, you want to go down downtown and grab an aurochs burger? That's the newest craze. They're very tough and not very good, but hey, it's uh, very expensive. And I like to buy things that are expensive to show off how well, you know, I'm doing in the world. They're not, you're not going to be able to do that. They're going to be releasing these into the wild as herds. And these things are big. I mean, they're like, they're, they're like six foot at the shoulder. And then they've got the big head on top of that. So imagine a bull that size, you know, that's, uh, that's pretty crazy, but they're going to, you know, release them back into the field so that they can do what they used to do before they were, you know, either hunted to extinction or bred out of existence. So kind of an interesting idea, but what they're doing is they're using the DNA and the DNA that's already in modern cattle. They're trying to take that DNA and they're looking at DNA samples from, you know, the, the aurochs bones that they've, um, that they've unearthed. And they're trying to, I guess, coax along the genes that are, you know, like that are in the current um, cattle. So I think it's a pretty interesting endeavor. I would love to and see well, it. I just want to see an aurochs, that's all. The, the point of this is that they used to roam freely around Europe, and they don't anymore. And so they want to reintroduce them to the wild ecosystem in Europe because there's, you know, like they say, there's not very much sense in breeding these back to their original species only to re-domesticate them again. Although they probably would be delicious. And the question for me is... Which will happen first the, through genetic manipulation and genetic engineering? This or the Santa cow? <laughs> Do we have a picture of the Santa cow? Is that even on the web? <laughs> I, I don't. It's probably somewhere on the website. But yeah. can you imagine how delicious steak from a Santa cow would be? It would be amazing. <laughs> All right. What else do we have to talk about here? Oh, we've got this is actually a kind of an interesting article I wanted to bring up because a lot of us romanticize romanticize is that the right word? A lot of us um, think about um, a lot of us think about artificial intelligence in terms of what we know as humans. And this article goes in and says, no, 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 we should not be thinking about it, thinking about it this way because as humans we've evolved to have certain tendencies to have tendencies for self-preservation to have tendencies to uh, I mean, even a lot of our morals are part of uh, the evolutionary process to make it it's who we are. It's it's a lot about survival as a species, but also survival as a collective, you know, uh, it's a give and take. And if we uh, generate, you know, new, I guess, a, a new being, it's not going to have the benefit of evolving through all these years, and it probably won't have the same values that we have. So that's one uh, bit of the equation that not a lot of people are looking at. So it's, it's kind of cool that they're looking at it here. This is at the Oxford, uh, Nick uh, Bostrom from the Oxford University Press here um, put this article together. And uh, I, I do recommend going and taking uh, a look at this. Some of it's a bit like, hey, we should be very scared because if we create artificial intelligence and it has a goal, it's probably not going to see us as being valuable to keep around. And let's suppose that artificial intelligence comes up and it's like, it, it decides like, well, what I need to do is resource gather. And so it's going to start resource gathering without any regard for us. And because it's, you know, we're not, it, it, preserving us is, might not be part of its, its equation unless we program it to do so, but I don't know. There's a I lot feel to like this. I I feel like Isaac Asimov explored a lot of this really well in a lot of his short stories. And if you haven't read those, you should go read those because the way that he laid it out in uh, a lot of his a lot of a lot of his stories is probably the way that it's going to play out when it actually does happen. I mean, the the robots and the artificial intelligence are probably going to try do something really terrible, trying to protect us from ourselves, and. Uh, <laughs> sometimes hilariously and sometimes terrifyingly but I, I'm not sure that that 
this type of intelligence, I, I really think that the first few, by the time the data set, the artificial intelligence, is built from a, a human data set, it's going to have traits like a human being. It, it can't help, uh, like, you know, the, the artificial intelligence won't uh, be totally unhuman because its entire data set will have come from a human society. So it might act in a completely unexpected way, and that's some of the delightful things in Asimov's stories. But in terms of like what motivates it and what drives it and, and, that, and that kind of thing, those things are going to come indirectly or directly from data sets that are based on human behavior and programming and, uh, and, and the things that go into that. I really, I really think that the most dangerous thing that we can invent would be artificial intelligence because, uh, because of the amoral component to it. Like if I created something tomorrow and I was like, use all of your resources to figure out a way that I can take over the planet, the artificial intelligence would completely amorally figure out the best way for me to take over the planet, which could have horrifying and disastrous consequences. Well, we just need to, uh, oh no, my camera's dead. Oh well, I'll do, it. I'll do it without the camera. We just need to make sure that it's, it's all religious because all morality comes from religion anyway. So it's, <laughs> I'm going to get hate mail for that from people who thought I'm serious, but, and then also people who think I'm making fun of them. But no, go ahead and send it. I enjoy the hate mail. We'll talk about video games for just a minute. Um, Payday, two, Payday 2 has a new DLC coming out, and it's private. But it's a Hotline Miami-based DLC that could be kind of interesting and fun. Um, Atari is going to be bringing back a lot of older games, like uh, Alone in the Dark is one of them, and also Haunted House, which came before Alone in the Dark. Um, the reason I'm mentioning this, I, I, it's cool to see them bringing back old games, uh, or old franchises. I would love to see, I always like new IPs, those are, those are cool, but um, one thing that's cool about Alone in the Dark is you'll be allowed to play um, multiplayer cooperatively, so I think it'd be kind of cool to wander around in, an, in, a, in a giant mansion or something in the dark, and you know, also have someone else roaming around in the dark with you so it'd be, it'd be cool if they could play the the monster kind of like the damned um let's see here what else do we have to talk about uh we could talk about the minecraft deal maybe i don't know maybe oh yeah My, microsoft is gonna buy minecraft for two billion dollars but that's just yeah. a rumor it, well you know the rumors have been getting bigger and bigger now they're saying that uh notch is the person or marcus peterson is the person who approached microsoft about this and and then there's another rumor saying that if this happens, that Notch won't be coming along with the the deal. It's just going to be you guys can have uh, you know the franchise. It's yours. You can do whatever you want with it. And then if it does happen, I think that immediately Microsoft is going to introduce some sort of a pay store where you can buy. Because I mean, there's already a pretty robust um, I, I guess modding community out there. People making skins and everything else for it. I guarantee you, Microsoft is going to want to try to. Uh, monetize that Sim similar to the, to the way like League of Legends works you know it's League of Legends is huge and everyone co goes online and spends tons of money on stuff like cos you know cosmetic upgrades for their character I bet Microsoft is going to do something like that if they pick it up because they've got to make their two billion dollars back all right uh, last thing to talk about today Grand Theft Auto 5 is going to be coming to the PS4 and Xbox One and the PC so yeah Xbox 5 do over edition yeah, it's going to have all kinds of new stuff. Um, a couple of new missions, they said. Some uh, additional wildlife and a new foliage system. Uh, damage and weather effects. So that should all be pretty cool. Uh, it's going to be out January 27th, uh, 2015. So if you guys have been waiting for this on the PC, and if all the freaking console people keep asking, like, hey, how's, uh, how's GTA V? Oh, yeah, you guys can't play it. I'm like, no, because we have about 700,000 other exclusive titles that are not available on any console. <laughs> There's actually a mod for Grand Theft Auto 4 that makes it look better than Grand Theft Auto 5 on the 360. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really does. It looks a lot better. Um, somebody said that to me the other day. I was like, dude, he, he was arguing about like how much better console was, and I was like, man, we have we have way more exclusives than you do, so stop talking about exclusives. And he wrote me, he wrote back, and his response was something to the effect of like, well, yeah, but. The exclusives on console are so, so good that you'll lose yourself for days, and all of the exclusives on PC suck. And that's why you can't talk to, to, to peasants, because there are, some, there are some really intelligent people out there that play console, and I do not consider them peasants. But whenever people just spout nonsense like that, where they clearly have no experience and it's just ignorance, then they're a peasant. And, and you just can't even engage in conversation with them because they're going to they're gonna spout these 
you know, nonsensical claims, and then I'm like, why am I wasting 20 seconds of my day replying to this person who obviously, you know, has nothing has nothing scientific to say. So, when talking to peasants, first qualify them uh, in a scientific manner. Make sure that they're able to, uh, you know, add some decent arguments to the to the whatever. I don't know, I'm done. <laughs> like my camera's dead. I'm just a black corner in the screen. And oh, uh, no. this is me. This is me right now. Just I, just, I, I am the darkness right now. So I've, I've got this fancy camera. I got a. I got the speed booster. I've got these fancy lenses and all this fancy gear. And uh, it's. I'm, I'm, just I'm Batman. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> here I am in the back cave. Excellent. All right. I'll let you do the closing since I'm nothingness. That's it. <laughs> I was going to try to do the, like the Porky Pig thing, but I don't think that that's going to do it at all. It was like, you know, that's all folks or whatever at the end of... Uh, but uh, So Hold until on, you're, next you're time... Gonna, you're going to yeah. offend some liberal arts school students if you do that, that stuttering thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to watch out for them. <laughs> no, really, I have a speech impediment. Uh, that's <laughs> <honest>. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's fine. Mm. So thanks again to our tech support members, and we will see you on the website and in the forums. Mm.